In this video, I'm going to be talking about my shocking experiences and what I had to go through as a 12 year old child when I was locked up and put in Roycroft Clinic in Newcastle upon Tyne in England and I stayed there for many, many years. And what I'm about to talk about today um, is from my upcoming memoir about this and you can download a completely free 15 page preview of this by clicking the link in the description. I'm almost at a thousand subscribers, it honestly it means the world to me. If you are interested in finding out about what goes on in the shocking UK mental health system, press that subscribe button because I make videos like this two or three times a week and it really is my passion um, to you know raise awareness of the evil that goes on. So yeah, the first thing I'm going to say about this is that abuse goes on all the time in these places. You know, I'm not the only one that's experienced this and I will not be the last, unfortunately. You know, the system's corrupt. The system's dangerous. You know, it's not really... These places aren't really treatment places. You get less rights than in prison. And I've made a separate video on my experiences of being in prison and, my God... I much preferred it than when I was locked up in hospital. So I was there between the years of 2007 and 2011, between 12 and 17 years old, which is a hell of a long time to miss out on your childhood. Due to that, I, you know, I've struggled and I have got severe PTSD due to the abuse that went on. You can do a quick Google search of Roycroft Clinic or Roycroft Clinic Newcastle or Roycroft Clinic abuse scandal and it comes up just the tiny snippet of what went on there um, you know the full story will never be revealed but I'm not going to explain I'm not going to go into explicit explicit detail on this channel because it wouldn't be right um, but what I am going to first of all say is when people talk about the devil and demons and stuff I've seen it you know, I've seen the worst of humanity. You know, I've seen grown men and grown women with NHS badges abuse kids in unimaginable ways. And they cover it up. They say, oh no, it's just their mental illness or oh no, they're making it up because they're ill or, you know, oh, there's no evidence and stuff. But I'm so happy that, you know, these things are getting reported more and more these days. Um, I share a lot on my social media, you know, screenshots and newspaper headlines of all this. Um, the place was a prison. The place was a, a torture chamber. And that's how I refer to it in my memoir. You didn't have any human rights. You were degraded daily. Um, and, you know, an example of this is the fact that I'm a lesbian. And I'm quite proud about that. I knew even then that I was gay. They used to be homophobic to me day in, day out. If I, let's say, I wrote a poem about girls or whatever, they just used to rip it up and punish me. Let's say two women, one TV, kissing on an EastEnders or whatever. They used to switch it off and then look at me and say, oh, no, we don't want her getting turned on. And that, like, made the other kids laugh at me and, like, turn against me and stuff. Um, if you were... Let's say you were really struggling. Let's say you were struggling to get out of bed because, you know, with depression or whatever. Um, the staff, they used to just play mind games. They used to just knock on your door. They used to, you know, put stereos outside, blast the music. They used to come in sometimes and drag you out of the bed. And even if you were just in your knickers, even if you was naked sometimes, you were just left in the corridor. And... Again, as a child going through that, that's unimaginable. Um, contact with family, friends, partners was very, very minimal. Um, you couldn't use the phone when you wanted. Um, you couldn't write letters when you wanted. You couldn't go out when you wanted. It was a prison. It was worse than a prison. Because at least in prison, you get more rights, you know? You can at least express more of your, your individuality in a prison than in you, that, well, that particular UK mental hospital indeed and many others I've been in, which I'll make more videos on. Um, I used to, I used to let's say, write. 
you know, let's say I wanted to write, because it's always been my thing, writing. It's it really cathartic for me, and it's been my recovery. Um, they used to deliberately rip up my papers, because the staff had access to your room any time they wanted. And that's a scary thought. When I was asleep, they used to sometimes come in, and... I was asleep, so I didn't know, and I used to wake up and my diary was ripped up, or my, you know, something was missing out my room, or worse, they did other things to me, which I, I'm going to imply, but not say, um, and those things went on a lot when you was wanting to get a shower, um, you know, it's, they used to come in and do certain bad things while I was in the shower, and... If you can imagine five years of that, you can kind of imagine the level of PTSD that I have. But, like I said, talking about it doesn't really trigger me or upset me anymore because it's been that long ago and I've processed it that I find it actually quite cathartic to talk about it, to raise awareness and to kind of encourage people to share and speak out because this is what goes on. And I speak to people that were there a few people that were there and they also have PTSD and they also, you know, speak out about it. So I'm just going to say, you know, I'm, I'm so happy that other people have survived that evil ordeal that went on there. Um, but, you know, we need to continue continue fighting. Um, freedom of individuality was frowned upon and anything that went out against the establishment was monitored. Eminem was banned, you know, Rage Against the Machine was a no-no, um, uh, Public Enemy was a no, any real rap music really or anything that spoke out against the government or anything that talked about abuse, anything that talked about running away, anything that talked about revolution, banned. They used to cut chunks out of the newspaper. So let's say you uh, just picked up a newspaper, there's like big chunks out of it. And people will say, oh, well, what's missing there? And it's like, oh, oh, it's inappropriate. And my God, that word became, you know, like tap water, just constantly running and running and running. And it just gets a bit bland sometimes, you know? Inappropriate, inappropriate, inappropriate. They used to say that constantly. Even being yourself is inappropriate. Let's say, you know, you wanted to write a novel in your room. They said, sorry, that's inappropriate because you're not spending enough time with the staff. Or let's say you wanted to play a computer game. You say, sorry, that's inappropriate. You know, you know, you should be spending more time with your peers. There was always an excuse to just be a complete bastard. Um, mine, you know, they used to play mind games, you know. And the food was... Not that great. It was okay sometimes, but it wasn't anything to write about. Um, but you got starved, basically, because it was set portions and you couldn't ask for extras because you weren't allowed to have extras because it might make you put on weight. And half the time you was hungry, but you couldn't have snacks. Like, the snacks you were allowed were, like, healthy snacks. Like, you could only have certain types of snacks, like, certain snacks were banned. And it was only allowed two snacks a day. Like, you were allowed one chocolate bar and one packet of crisps. Actually, no, I think it was two chocolate bars and one packet of crisps a day. And you had to lock them in, like, a special wooden drawer where you got your name on it. And the staff used to, like, tick off a box, like, how many you can have a day. And that was the same with everything. You couldn't just watch TV in your room. You had to book it. You had to say right, I want to watch TV today, and you had to write it down on a form, and the staff used to, like, tick it off and sign it. So, obviously, you can imagine, if the staff didn't like you, they were like, nah, nah, you're not getting to watch TV today, or, no, you can't have that, you can't have a phone call to your dad today, you can't, you know, ring your girlfriend today, or whatever. They had complete power, you know? If you disagreed with a member of staff, you got nothing, you know? Um... I've always, I don't really watch it now uh, because I think it's rigged, but I used to watch The X Factor a lot and I really liked The X Factor and I loved watching The Simpsons and, you know, stuff like that and it was like a TV in the lounge with a box 
and you couldn't just switch it on and watch whatever you wanted like there was like another five or six seven patients and there was you know five staff so most of the time the staff just took the remote and watched what they wanted which was football or news or something like fishing when certain members of staff were on it was always fishing all day long and the patients were bored, bored out the head and you know the patients were like oh can't we watch something we like because it's our home you know what i'm saying and this you know the staff were like well no you know this is our workplace as well so you know you got yourself here you know so it's it's that mentality so in that respect you do get more rights in prison because in prison you get like a radio and, and tv in your cell so if you want to watch something watch it but in 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 the mental hospital it was you had to rely on staff in prison it's you kind of encouraged to be a little bit independent like don't get me wrong you have to ask for mostly everything but you don't really hear staff saying, oh, no, you can't watch that TV programme. You know, they don't they don't care like that. Um, the length of time I was there was ridiculous. Like I said, between the years of 12 and 17, uh, but, well, I know the dates, between the 29th of January 2007 and the 11th of, or 12th of December 2011. So it's like nearly five years of your life that's kind of stunted my growth and like intellectual ability i mean don't get me wrong i've not let it hold me back i've not let it ruin my life i use it to campaign for better and and, and, and ways awareness but i never got a reason for why i was locked up for that long nobody ever said to me you're here for that long and this is why they just kept me there and they kept me there and they kept me there and it got to a stage where even at the tribunals, because you have tribunals and mental health hospitals, like, where people sit down and discuss your case, they were saying, why is you here? And I've got all these reports, and it just basically says, you know, we're waiting for supported accommodation, we're waiting for another bed, we're waiting for this, and it's like, why can't I just go home? I never understood that, and I don't think I ever will understand that, because I never killed anybody, I never did anything that like never did anything serious like that um don't get me wrong i made some threats because i was ill but the amount of time i was locked up was horrendous and it's institutionalization and i'm going to make another video on this but when i was released i got very little support they didn't really recognize my institutionalization and they didn't want to take ownership of what they've done you know the nhs they basically said you know you're an adult now you know you're 20 and 18, 19, etc. You know, you need to grow up now and get on with it. Literally, that's what one of them said. So it's like, I struggled massively in the community and I ended up going to jail a few times on mental health related things. But that's another video. And if you subscribe, you'll, you'll get a notification when I make that. Um, the place was horrendous. The place was evil. I do believe it still stands because I've looked on Google Maps and it's still there. Plus, um, I... I speak to people and they say that the place still stands, so which is a bit ruining because, my God, the people that work there did not have a conscience, evil demons. And like I said, you know, I use that word quite... It's, they're, not even de they're not even demons, they're humans, but they're worse than demons because demons, like devils and stuff, the ones that float about with horns... Mate, that doesn't scare me. You know, when you've been abused as a 12-year-old kid by, you know, corrupt institutions, things that you see in horror films and, you know, insidious and all that paranormal activity and all that doesn't scare you one bit. Because it's like nothing scarier than knowing that you're going to be abused and doing being too scared to do anything, being too scared to complain because you know that the abuse is going to be worse that's worse than any demon because that is that is humanity humanity is the devil but yeah i mean there's so much i could like i said you know i could make a video that was 20 hours on on the roycroft clinic um 
I'll put some links in the description for you to check out. Uh, like I said, you know, subscribe for more videos like this because I'm going to make more videos and on and on and on. Um, well, talking more about all the different ones that I've been in and, and why. Um, so, yeah, thank you for watching and stay safe and share, raise awareness of this bullshit. All right, in a bit.